question. So just take a minute and gather your attention and we'll do refuge in bodhicitta. Sange chu don sogi chu nam dai jan chu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chu nyan gi pe sonam ki ro la pen chu sange ju pa sho sange chu don sogi chu nam la jan chu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chu nyan gi pe sonam ki Rola penche sange dru pa sho sange churan sogi chunam la janju badu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki rola penche sange dru pa sho okay welcome everybody Nice to see you guys. I'm just peeking at my Zoom cubes. Very nice, very good cubing. Um, those of you that are not uh, pictured, um, I'm guessing it's a technology issue or it's a illness issue and that is completely acceptable. Um, today we're gonna look a little bit again at the five omnipresent mental factors because I think that they're really fascinating in terms of unpacking our experience. So we'll review those from last time, and then we'll dig into some more mental factors and kind of see how we can impose a degree of control on our mental experience and also know kind of how much is a reasonable amount. Because I think sometimes we expect too much of ourselves and we're fighting against the wave of habit. And so how to really have reasonable expectations of our own progress mentally and uh, not such a war internally. So I think that understanding mental factors can really help you understand your everyday life situation. So I'm gonna review a couple of the points that are really important and um, then I'm gonna go into some new stuff as well. All right. So this will keep coming up. This is very important. The nature of consciousness is clear and knowing. And when you see that the nature of consciousness is clear and knowing, it's important to understand what that means. Clear expresses the essential nature of consciousness. Aware expresses its function. So clear and knowing is talking about what the mind is able to do and what it's continuously doing. It's not saying that that's accurate or inaccurate. It's more of the reflective quality and the quality of holding that we're talking about. So sometimes when you hear clear and knowing or clear and aware, it makes it sound like you already have perfect wisdom and that, well, no problem then. So don't be confused by the terminology. And then we were looking at this schema, which is a really important one to understand when digging into the mind. So just to review, all phenomena means that which holds or retains its essence or its essential nature. And we have permanent phenomena, which usually don't cause any trouble, so we don't give them much airtime. So those non-momentary static phenomena doesn't change moment to moment, but not necessarily eternal. Then we have our momentary impermanent phenomena that do change moment to moment, but may have an internal, excuse me, eternal continuity. So we've talked a bit about permanent and we've talked about a phenomena a little bit, but mostly we're just discussing impermanent phenomena because that's the contents of our life that is particularly relevant. And then of impermanent phenomena, we have form, which is like matter, like a body or rock. And science does a very good job of explaining about form. And then we have consciousness, clear and knowing, and then we have non-associated composites, which are neither form nor consciousness like a person. So most relevant to us is consciousness here in this class and millions of ways to divide consciousness. But what we're talking about are two functions of consciousness, main minds and mental factors. 
So when we do this categorization and recategorization and recategorization, don't feel like it's like different boxes or something. It's all consciousness, but we're talking about different functions of consciousness so that we can understand them more clearly. Okay. And then we had a brief touch into the tantric presentation, which is coarse, subtle, and extremely subtle, which is nice and simple and clean and tidy, but doesn't give you as much to work with, particularly in a general audience of people that don't necessarily practice Tantra. Okay, so there was a question um, that came through the emails from my good friend Jill in the Blue Mountains. She says, um, how can something that holds its essential nature, doesn't that make it inherently existent? And I see all my typos showing up now that I read it out loud, excuse me. So let's just review phenomena. That which retains or holds its essential nature. This is equivalent to existent, established basis, object, and knowable object. So before we get into it, does anyone have some thoughts about that particular question? Do you feel like you might know the answer? <laughs> or have some guesses before you hear me blah, blah about it? Did anyone else have that question when I was talking about what phenomena is and what phenomena is are those things that hold their essential nature? Then you thought about your emptiness teachings and you thought, well, that sounds like a phenomena is inherently existent. What, what? I'm guessing somebody had that question besides Jill. Did anyone have uh, an immediate answer come up when I was reading that poorly transcribed question? Excuse my typos. Does it feel like a contradiction? How would you answer, Jill? <laughs> Roxy, go ahead. No, you know, I, I really don't have an answer for this, but I, I was thinking as you asked the question about how many times I've taken courses on emptiness and how many times I've heard the cup um, <laughs> metaphor um, as something that um, holds, it holds, you know, tea. Brown body and, and water receptacle. Something all, yeah, whatever. So, so it has some, it has some characteristics. Um, if you take some of them away, then it's no longer a cup. It's, so it's not, e you know, eternally a cup, um, but it is, What's the word I'm looking for? It is, it's a cup in the sense of its functionality or use. So it, I think of holding as something like a sense, like the, the eyes hold the capacity for transmitting, you know, visual uh, capabilities and the ears hearing. And so these sense, um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm sorry that I'm not very uh, um, articulate, but I, I think of these as being sort of um, just, things that are not, do not have inherent existence forever and ever, amen, but just have the, the function of yeah. holding something like um, consciousness or vision or sound or tea in a temporary yeah. sense. Yeah, okay, exactly. take yeah, it away. You're, you're, you're going in make, the, me, you're, make me be quiet, okay. No, no, you're going in the, totally the correct direction. <laughs> totally the correct direction. I mean, what you're basically saying is that stuff has a function, but that doesn't mean it's inherently existent. But it can function while it exists relatively impermanently, nominally, merely labeled by the mind. You can drink from your cup of water, but that doesn't make it, it eternally a cup because it could break, because it changes moment to moment, it'll become dust. And also the cup is not inherently existent because it depends upon causes and conditions, parts, context, a mind to impute on the valid basis, all sorts of stuff. So it's not inherently existent, but it functions relatively and that's no problem. And I remember when um, I was asking my one of my teachers about this, I was saying, um, you know, what is it that makes us able to agree? If things aren't inherently existent, why can we all agree that's a cup? Isn't if there's not something cupness from its own side, you know, or even if we don't have the same language or word, if we're all human beings, we could agree that that thing could have liquid go in it. How do we come to agreement? 
And he was saying basically because it's reliant upon valid cognition that we talked about in the first week and that worldly convention does not destroy that. But worldly convention doesn't make things inherently existent because you go into that kind of like unpacking and unpacking of dependent arising until you can't find any one thing that is the thing nor the collection and it just kind of is in that razor's edge of does it exist or doesn't it it does exist but just nominally just in mere name and we can like almost taste it while we're talking about it and then we go about our daily life and there's just some people who are rat bags and we don't like them it feels very obvious right and there's people that are just lovely and wonderful and we want them around all the time seems obvious so it's like we get right on the cusp of getting these points just tiny little nuggets of i think i've almost got it intellectually okay and then we lose the thread and we go back to our life so i think so important with all of these discussions is to take these intellectual concepts and then to apply it immediately in that same day with some sort of memory you have and say, how does that knowledge, that traditional wisdom of Buddhism apply to my life? And how can I really make it real and tangible? So coming back to phenomena, some of it is just the way we use language in Buddhism. So I'll talk a little bit about that and maybe it'll get clearer. So we begin with selfless, right? The selfless, that which does not exist inherently. It has two divisions, nice and simple. The existent, right? The existent is that which is perceivable by mind, that which is suitable to be known by an awareness. Existent is synonymous with phenomena, lowercase d, dharma. Object of knowledge, established base, and object. Okay, so selfless has two divisions. Basically everything is selfless. Everything lacks inherent existence. There are two types of things, the existent and then surprise, surprise, the non-existent. So that which is not perceivable by mind. And this was a little bit like Sne's question a couple of weeks ago. So if something exists, a consciousness must be able to perceive it. A table is existent, a rabbit's horn is not. So despite the fact that we can visualize and imagine a rabbit with a horn doesn't mean that it's existent. Okay, so we're talking about existent in a slightly different way than you might assume. And that's part of the tangle. So if we come back to the question, phenomena are that which hold their essential nature. If something holds its essential nature, doesn't that make it inherently existent? So phenomena are perceivable by the mind therefore they are existent but that doesn't mean make them inherently existent as phenomena are included in the twofold division of the selfless okay and the relative nature of phenomena hold their nature in the sense of their characteristics are agreed on by worldly convention which is one of the criteria we use for something to be a valid basis for us to label okay so that's phenomena, a little bit more unpacked. Um, I'm looking, I'm seeing in the chat, there's some questions. Ah, and someone was confused about how phenomena is different from form. Um, and form is considered impermanent. And I think the, the confusion with how form is impermanent is that we talk about impermanent in terms of subtle impermanence, which is far too kind of quiet and nuanced for us to see in a momentary way, and coarse impermanence, which is obvious. So when we say impermanent, we're not just talking about changes that are abrupt or changes that are obvious. We're talking about the scientific momentary change of objects like take a cup, if it's sitting on your counter for 10 years unmoving, it's still changing moment to moment to moment, but that change is not perceptible by your eyes. But if you left it on the counter and you came back in 30 years, it would be maybe slightly smaller or it would be losing color. It might even be a pile of dust if it was cheap porcelain. So change will have happened, but it wasn't an abrupt change. 
so form is impermanent. Phenomena is a big category which contains both permanent and impermanent things. Did I lose anybody? Are you with me so far? Yeah, some thumbs up. Or enough so to proceed? <laughs> enough so to proceed, okay. All right. All right, so we're really just looking at consciousness, but the rest of the context is important to get clear on. So I'm including it, but really we're talking about consciousness. And last week we were talking about the five omnipresent mental factors. So these guys get grouped, the five omnipresent mental factors, the five object ascertaining mental factors and the four variable mental factors because they share the characteristics of being functions of the mind that in and of themselves are neither wholesome or unwholesome. They become wholesome or unwholesome based on what other mental factors are accompanying them. So this is what we did last week. So feeling, feelings, exper feeling experiences the results of our past actions. So it's physical or mental or both, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Discernment, it apprehends, differentiates, and identifies objects. Intention is action, karma. Attention or mental engagement, it focuses the mind. Contact, it is the cause of feeling. So to put it kind of more experientially, we can think feeling is what experiences, discernment is what recognizes, intention is what moves, attention is what holds, and contact is what connects. And these five are always present. Every single moment of every single day, our mind has these five plus <laughs> any number of other ones. And these five get then colored by other mental factors like anger or love. They get colored, they get conditioned. So in and of themselves, they're not positive or negative, but because of what other mental factors are in our mind, they become so. So we were talking about how in terms of daily life practice, feeling is kind of our most visceral experience that we have I guess our most reactivity and responsiveness to on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we can do the simple project of noticing feeling with enough objectivity to not believe everything that it's telling us. If we can have feeling, you know, a, a, an unpleasant physical feeling or a pleasant mental feeling and that not buy into the story that the reason for that feeling is everything happening in the present moment, right? We're remembering that feeling is a conditioned response, that feeling is the conditions of the present meeting with the causes of the past. And so more than one thing is happening simultaneously and yet we give all of the credit or all of the punishment or all of the power to the thing right in front of us and say, you are why I feel this way good or bad, you person in front of me, which is an exaggeration, which makes us disempowered and it makes us repetitive in our efforts to try and get more of the good and less of the bad when we don't have the whole story. So when we were talking about feeling last week, did you have any thoughts come up about it? Feeling is not equivalent to emotion was probably the first thing that came clear. Did you have any questions about feeling? Does it make sense how to start practicing with feeling? I'm I mean, the easy. Very... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Sorry. I'm not uh, oh, very sure that I'm understanding feeling. And uh, when you say when when I'm sad. So it's my feeling and for me, feeling and emotion, it's like vaguely the same. Like emotionally, can, can, uh, somebody um, has feel, a feeling 
and has emotion for me. Uh, in like... English, they are the same, right? In English, they're almost always synonyms depending on context, but in English, they usually are colloquially the same thing. Oh. In Buddhism, oh. they're not. In Buddhism, emotion isn't even really a categorization because it's too broad. When we say emotion in English, it includes several mental factors in Buddhism simultaneously. So it's too vague a word to use. Some mm -hmm. people might use it, but feeling in Buddhism just means experience. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily if you agree with that experience or disagree with that experience. It's just the visceral experiencing itself. And then discernment might be saying the reason for this feeling is this and this and that which might be accurate or be inaccurate, most likely. And then attention is like, I'm going to hold my attention there on that thing that seems to be related to my feeling experience. And then intention says, I'm going to move closer to that thing that seems to be giving me a good feeling, or I'm going to run away from that thing that seems to be giving me a bad feeling. But your discernment was confused. And then your intention is flawed. And then your karma created is unfortunate. And so it goes. You know, so, um, I, so I remember last week you uh, told us about the person like Dalai Lama or uh, uh, the very good teachers that they are they have tainted mind stream or something with love that makes them uh, every, every in every situation and every feeling it's basically they they see they see every moment that people are suffering like sentient beings are suffering so um is it the same that we are going to do that in purpose to like to take our distance with the emotion and with the feelings or emotion in the moment to bring our compassionate feelings and uh, like take our distance in our daily life take our distance and see that it is not it is the, the feeling that it seems to me because of my karma and they are suffering and they, it's not personal. You, you are it, mixing many concepts together in a lovely way, which works fair, you know, well enough, but there are a lot of concepts that you're bringing together. And what I'm saying is you can, you can do that, that's fine, but you can also kind of take one mental factor in isolation and decide that that's your project for a while. For example, if you were to choose feeling, you would say, when I experience a pleasant feeling, may I prevent that from turning into attachment? When I experience an unpleasant feeling, may I prevent that from turning into aversion? May I just experience feeling arising and dissolving and let it roll through like the wave experience that it is without push and pull and reactivity. And to acknowledge that what I feel in the present is conditioned by the past. So I don't need to color the present with a whole story of these are all the reasons why I'm experiencing this. So that's one way of just kind of, I'm gonna work on feeling to be, a, to be less problematically reactive to it. But you could just as easily pick one of the other mental factors like discernment and marry that with feeling and say, all right, so I'm feeling this unpleasant experience. How can I discern and label it in such a way that is closer to truth? So then you bring in your analytical abilities and you bring in your low jong techniques and you think, all right, suffering can help me understand the suffering of others and build into compassion. Happiness can help me want to expand and share and et cetera, et cetera. So you can start to kind of color your experience in such a way that it creates momentum for practice rather than just feeling like things keep happening to you powerlessly. So it feels like life is happening to us when in fact life is happening from us, right? And so we feel powerless, we feel disempowered, we feel disenfranchised, we feel isolated, we feel disconnected, we feel superstitious. And all of that is because we're not understanding our own experience or its relationship to all other experiences and all other phenomena. And then we feel all alone with our madness. And so, Understanding these mental factors is just kind of a thought project where you can sit with which of the mental factors could I start to exert 
a little bit more positive control over and which maybe are too strongly habituated for me to really touch too much right now. Or the reverse, you take the hardest ones first. It's really mm -hmm. up to you. It's such a personal thing, this kind of practice. But if you've ever studied the four close placements of mindfulness, for example, a lot of that um, is reinforced by understanding the omnipresent mental factors, particularly feeling. And so if you can kind of just get used to acknowledging experience without needing it to mean anything in particular. And I guess the danger I feel as I say this is to, it's not that I want us to stop believing our gut feeling or to stop believing our intuition or these kind of Western concepts that we talk about a lot. You know, you, there are patterns that we've recognized in our life. There is common sense that we have. And if we have a, I feel uncomfortable and I think the reason is this is not safe. It's not like you want to have a whole intellectual conversation with yourself about that and then get robbed on the subway. You know, it, it's not like we want to second guess the parts of our wisdom that have been conditioned well. It's just we want to be able to have that objectivity with our own experience that isn't believing every repetitive thought in our head. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yes, very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lara. Um, other other thoughts, questions or thoughts? Yes, Nay, go ahead. Um, that, that was such a beautiful way of 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 helping me um, think about feeling. I wonder if you would also talk through intention. Yeah, and intention is is very much uh, correlated to our karma conversations. Right, so karma is a, you know, a big whole nuanced conversation, but uh, intention, generally speaking, is karma, mental karma, very broadly. There is karma that is action and there is karma that is intended action and see the Lamrim Chenmo for details. But if you want to think about it just experientially, it's the movement, the movement towards or away. And the movement towards or away certain things is of course conditioned by other mental factors. And it's those other mental factors with intention and all of the other choices around that, that plant sort of heavier or lighter karmic seeds, whether positive or negative. So if you think, you know, sitting still quietly in your room, it doesn't feel like your mind is moving towards in a way certain things, right? But every second of every day, there is that subtle, I want more of this, less of that. I'm interested in that, I'm disinterested in this. Right? There's movement of the mind. And then attention comes along and says, well, since that's interesting, let's stay there. Yeah. And this is a, you know, a gross oversimplification, but I think it helps to make it a little bit more visceral to really think in terms of what are they doing, even though they're all doing simultaneously. So what you want to be doing with intention if you're working with that one is to think, all right, if my mind is moving towards the things that I think are giving me happiness, is it moving towards them in a way that is positive and healthy and beneficial and conditioned by wisdom? Or is it moving towards those things with an attachment mind that's doomed to failure and is going to turn into anger? So that movement itself isn't positive or negative in and of itself. It's just so, so conditioned with problematic behaviors that it's not really doing us much of a service most of the time. So when we're talking about setting our motivation, it's almost like we're capturing intention and deciding to color it a certain way and say, okay, movements of the mind, be bodhicitta, okay? Yes, now be bodhicitta, movements of mind. Yeah, and it will stay happily bodhicitta-ish, bodhicitta-adjacent <laughs> movements of mind until you lose your focus and forget, and then maybe you go back to kind of a dull, sleepy, neutral, I'm revealing too much about myself, or a kind of a grumpy, agitated irritability, or whatever, right? It'll kind of lapse back to your default setting, which is going to be slightly needy and attached, slightly irritable and annoyed, or kind of vague and spacey depending on your vibe, right? <laughs> One of the three poisons is gonna be your default setting and maybe they take turns and it doesn't really matter which, but that self-knowing is vital. 
And those, you know, knowing that about yourself, then you understand how your intention gets conditioned. Does that help? Yeah. And then at the end of the day, you do your Vajrasattva and you think, all right, the movements of my mind have been somewhat problematic. Okay, yes, purifying those. And then other movements of the mind, somewhat beneficial, rejoicing in those. Any number of them, I do not remember. Let's hope they were generally neutral or at least sort of friendly. Okay, tomorrow, what? Tomorrow, what needs to be more and continuous? Tomorrow, what needs to be less and addressed? You know, just very gentle, quiet plans. And it can feel kind of either boring or religious or rigid, but to kind of sit with the very good psychology of the training in Tibetan Buddhism of setting your motivation in the morning, doing some purification at night, that bookending of your days means that your life doesn't just run away from you, you know, and all the days blurring into each other. It's like you're actually gathering some momentum and creating some continuity and it doesn't have to be all formal and fancy. You can be in your bed all snuggly, setting your motivation, and then grudgingly get out of bed and go, yes, yes, bodhicitta, yes, bodhicitta. And it gets truer and truer as the morning goes on. You're brushing your teeth, bodhicitta, bodhicitta, right? And then you have your shower, and then you're really feeling bodhicitta because you had your shower, and now you're dressed, and okay, now I'm going to actually meditate on it. But all those, you know, quiet background thoughts build a sort of momentum. And it doesn't have to be formal. It's just your own mind. And at the end of the day, if Vajrasattva is intimidating, you can just sit in your favorite armchair with your cup of tea and think, how was today? How was I in alignment with my path? Where did I fall off it? And not identify with the pros or the cons, just be strategic and logistical about how can I have a deeper and more meaningful life that's of greater benefit to everyone, including myself. And then if you want to add Vajrasattva, excellent. Yep, kills the magnifying power of negative karma. We like that. For opponent powers, make sure that's not going to turn into suffering. We love that. But really the patterns are kind of the hard thing to get into you. A little something morning, a little something evening. Once you have those patterns in your mind going, it's easy enough to deepen them and elaborate on them and build from them. So if you can even make a very quiet and gentle discipline, then it's uh, life's easier, I think. Okay, there's a message in the chat. Okay, it seems as if discernment is fundamental to the other factors. If you're not discerning correctly, what something is or is not, everything else seems likely to go off track. I say, true, <laughs> true, that is definitely true. So, you know, I think sometimes analytical meditation doesn't get enough airtime because it's too thinky, yeah, too much thinky. And then we think it's not so fancy as Shine and it's not so fancy as Tantra, but Analytical meditation is one of the many ways we can condition discernment so that it's healthier and more accurate. Um, and you're quite right. It's like if we're mislabeling our experience and discernment's not only like verbal labels, it's a lot more subtle than that. Even animals have discernment. But, you know, if you're kind of educating your discernment, all of the other mental factors are going to fall into line with a lot more health and a lot more, you know, kind of spiritual productivity for lack of a better word so for sure and you know that's kind of like taking different times in the day to focus on different mental factors it can kind of be some parts of the day it's easier to be focused on how you're discerning things some days it might be easier to figure out how you're feeling things really it's up to you it's up to you what sort of makes sense but um knowing that these are all ticking along in there continuously can kind of give you a motivation to start tidying some of them up and getting a little bit more health into them. I was talking last week about the mental factor of contact, which generally speaking is the outside meeting the inside, which is the catalyst kind of for your feeling experience or one of the big conditions for watering past karmic seeds to ripen as present day feeling. And that you know, what you come into contact with, I think has to be very intentional because of how strong our bad habits are. 
So, uh, you know, like I mentioned last week, going into a bar is not negative or positive in and of itself, right? It's just a place where things happen. But if you have a problem with alcohol, going into a bar is going to make it harder for you to keep your new habit of health. If you don't have a problem with alcohol, it might just be a convenient place to go to the bathroom on a road trip and it's no big deal. So it's like it's not the bar's fault, but coming into contact with that situation, meeting it with your mind is going to have an effect of some kind based on your previous conditioning. So when you're working with contact, you're really asking yourself, what's going to give me the best conditions for my spiritual path? And what kind of things do I come into contact with that my relationship to them is too overpowering to really trust myself to stay positive? And it might be, you know, with certain friends who you know are big gossips, that you know you can be strong with them for the first couple of minutes and not slide into a gossip trap. But after, you know, five, 10 minutes, and they go on and on about this political issue or that annoying boss or this shared friend who's aggravating, you're going to kind of slide into that old pattern of gossip again. But if you're with this other friend, you talk about ideas and collaboration and all sorts of healthy things, because both potentials are within you. So the responsibility on us is to ask, what do we have the strength to come into contact with and it actually be positive? And what do we need to be really honest and gentle and accepting of ourselves about and don't come into contact with because our positive states of mind haven't been conditioned strong enough to respond well to coming into contact with them. So it's, you know, it's not like shutting out bad friends, but it's about being conscious about minimizing time with them until you build your strength to be a better positive influence on them than they are a negative influence on you. Thoughts? Is it sounding like good common sense or is it sounding kind of weird? <laughs> common sense, thumbs up, okay. And you can argue with me, you know, I like a good argument. Okay, so attention holds and focuses the mind. It's very much related to intention. Contact connects. So these are the five omnipresent mental factors. And, you know, just kind of know them, know they exist. You don't have to memorize them, but just kind of have a sense of this is what's happening all the time. Okay. So that's those guys. And then we'll move on to the five object ascertaining mental factors. Okay, so they are aspiration, appreciation, recollection or mindfulness, depending on your translator, concentration and intelligence. And they are so called because they apprehend the individual features of an object which of course sounds very much like the mental factor of discernment that we just talked about, but here it's much more specific. So the compendium of knowledge asserts that they accompany only virtuous mental states. Some other commentaries um, would argue that they accompany all mental states, but the agreement seems to be amongst our Gelug tradition, Tibetan Geshis, that they accompany only virtuous mental states, and I think there's good arguments to agree with that. So these five are also not themselves virtuous, but become virtuous because of being associated with virtuous mental states, and the argument here is that they're always associated with virtuous mental states. So in this case, the mindfulness accompanying a mental consciousness that apprehends and has aversion toward a repulsive object would not be the mindfulness of the five object ascertaining mental factors, but would be another mental factor similar to it. Okay. So I guess to kind of make that clearer, remember the definition of affliction is that which makes the mind unpeaceful. So if there is agitation together with what you're focusing on, it's not going to be virtuous. 
So you know that um, just by being in the zone with good focus doesn't mean that it's necessarily positive because there's probably a little bit of like hungry attachment wanting more and more and more, that kind of stuff. So with these five objects ascertaining mental factors, these are the ones that are very useful to look at in terms of your meditation practice specifically. You can look at, at them in terms of life in general, but they're very useful when you're trying to get your meditation practice to be a lot more solid and grounded. So first is aspiration, which takes a strong interest in an intended object and is the basis for joyous effort. And I think that this is a very powerful thing to know because sometimes I think we feel like we should just have joyous effort if something is positive. And we're trying to like force the joy because it's a good thing, but we're not really feeling it yet. And so what that means is that we need more aspiration. So it might be that we've been trying to meditate for years because we like the idea of meditation, but we haven't had enough training or conditions or merit or any number of things for it to kind of give us the joy while we're doing it. And so instead of thinking that there's anything wrong with you or anything wrong with the practice, go back a step to aspiration and ask yourself, what is it that I want? What is it I want from this practice? And where can I find belief in this practice prior to my own deep experience of it? And how can I develop this mind that is really inspired and enriched with the idea of something? So much so that then the practice and the effort involved becomes pleasant in and of itself, even though it's effort. And then of course, what happens after joyous effort is then pliancy or an ease. Yeah, so you get faith, aspiration, joyous effort, pliancy as your um, first four antidotes to laziness when you're talking about the nine stages of mental abidance, some of you will remember, five faults, eight antidotes, right? So this is a similar kind of idea that if the mind is aspiring, it leads to joy. You don't have to force the joy. You don't have to feel the joy when there's effort. Maybe take a step back and go back to your aspirations and really think about why it is you want to do what you're doing so that it doesn't feel like a chore or a have to. You remember the kind of delight in first meeting certain ideas and let that build into a momentum you can take back to your cushion. And then it is effort to focus. It is effort to kind of go through with it. There's part of your mind that is very happy about that, despite there being effort. And then, of course, with lots of effort, it becomes effortless. So aspiration. And then we have appreciation, which is sometimes translated as belief, which stabilizes the apprehension of a previously ascertained object and holds it such that it cannot be distracted by another view. So this is tying into kind of having correct belief um, or having kind of deep conviction in things. Appreciation or belief is a stabilizing factor which you've already come to understand something, but now you're holding it in such a way that um, you're not kind of diverted by other stimuli. And so then in meditation, what you're having is like an interest in the meditation object that has conviction in its importance, that has appreciation of it. And when other things occur to you, you're not as tempted to be pulled. So, just my own opinion, but the way I feel like this functions in meditation is if you choose a meditation object, say the image of Shakyamuni Buddha in the space in front, you know, this high, right, sense of light, sense of heaviness, good old shamatha, okay, you've got your mental object. If you bring a sense of appreciation to it, you have a different way of focusing. You're interested. And if you're interested, it's much easier to be absorbed and to stay and to have continuity. But if you're just bringing it to mind in kind of a more mechanical or kind of passive way of this is the thing I've chosen to develop single pointed concentration in relation to. So I'm just going to pop it into my mind and hold it there. 
it doesn't have the same power in your focus that that it would have if you'd really brought appreciation interest belief to it yeah so the way in which you're holding the object is different even though it's the same object of mind the other mental factors you bring to it are making you able to stabilize with a lot more um lightness a lot more joyfulness and also it just works better it's a lot more effective so i remember one of the nuns at chenrezig institute she would always say so bring up to mind your meditation object and now give it your interest <laughs> so there was really a kind of a twofold process of bring it to mind and now be curious about it be engaged with it lean into it not just kind of passively hold it there so the same could be true of the breath, right? And it's not like you have to find the breath interesting, like, oh, there's a shallow breath, oh, there's a long breath. It's more just kind of your way of focusing has a type of deeper engagement. And that's a bit about what we're talking about with this appreciation mental factor. Do you have any thoughts or questions about that or additions you've heard from other teachers or places? Appreciation, what does it do to your mind? Does it make sense the way in which appreciation would help your meditation? Ish. <laughs> yeah, Roxy, go ahead. I'm just trying to be an active member of your class because I'm a teacher too and I appreciate that. But mostly I'm just thinking about whether or not it's related to analytical meditation in that a form of appreciation could be to analyze the meaning, say, of the colors of the object of contemplation or, um, you know, what does this lotus, um, what does the moon disc mean or something? Um, is that, would that be just one of many different forms of appreciation? I think those would be steps prior. Those would be the steps prior. So it's like having done those steps, then you have the appreciation. So when, so, so it's more affective, it's more emotive, you're actually, you've thought about this intellectually, and now you're kind of marinating in the feeling of appreciation. Yes, I like that. <laughs> okay. I say yes, but okay, um, thank you. read commentaries to be sure. <laughs> I say yes. <laughs> yeah, I like the way you've described it. Yeah, so, you know, to go back to this, like, technical, technical definition, when it says stabilizes the apprehension of a previously ascertained object, it's talking about something that you've already understood. It's something that you've already come to understanding with. And then having done that, you're holding it in your mind and that holding has the strength to not be distracted. But why is that? Because previously you've ascertained this object seen its benefits, seen its qualities, et cetera, et cetera. So then mindfulness is repeatedly brings to mind a phenomena of a previous acquaintance without forgetting it. It does not allow the mind to be distracted from the object and is the basis for concentration. And according to the Pali Abhidharma, mindfulness accompanies only a virtuous mind. So this is interesting, isn't it? Because we use mindfulness so broadly nowadays. Um, sometimes people use mindfulness as if it's equivalent to shamatha, shine, serenity, calm abiding, single pointed concentration. That single pointed concentration meditation is mindfulness meditation. And there's an argument for that. But I think it's important for when you hear the word mindfulness to know the context of the speaker and what do they mean by that word. Because technically here we're talking about non-forgetfulness of a virtuous object, not forgetting it. So mindfulness that is conditioned by some sort of agenda. Um, sometimes Lama Zopa will say bodhicitta mindfulness, which means you're not forgetting a virtuous object. The virtuous object is bodhicitta. So you're walking around, living your life, washing your hands, you know, chopping vegetables, putting them in the soup pot, and all of that is conditioned by may all sentient beings achieve their fullest potential for the benefit of all other sentient beings. May everyone become a Buddha. It's conditioned by 
bodhicitta coloring. Yeah, so you're sort of not forgetting that the point of everything is bodhicitta while going about your daily life. And for us ordinary folks, it's not like that can all happen simultaneously or very often, but you act as if it is the case by coming back to that intention, that motivation again and again, even with ordinary things, maybe especially with ordinary things, because bringing to mind mindfulness, this non-forgetting on purpose again and again, is the very thing that makes a positive state of mind kind of morph from a, a state of mind to a main mind, which is what I was talking about yesterday with people who seem to have higher qualities like His Holiness. It, it's theoretically the case that having conditioned the mental factors with so much bodhicitta that they become so deeply ingrained that then bodhicitta moves from being a mental factor that you have to conjure up to a main mind that conditions everything else. Yeah, and this is what we would call a realization or entering the Mahayana path of accumulation, which also would include renunciation. But when we're talking about these fundamental shifts, it's through repetition. It's through, you know, merit, yes, mental merit. But mainly what we're talking about is coming back to something you already believe, love, and agree with on purpose again and again. And then it sticks more and more, and it conditions everything else. And that becomes your default setting. That becomes how you naturally are because it's a spontaneous thing built on lots of effort that preceded it. So, you know, the lots of examples, I'm sure you've heard lots of teachers give examples of this, but I always think about it when you were a little kid and you learned how to read, you know, and you had to laboriously repeat the alphabet again and again and laboriously sound out words again and again. And then in one magic moment, you could read and now words jump off the page at you, not you trying to force them into clarity. You know, they just pop off the screen. You just read things. And that magic moment was the result of many, many, many moments that preceded it. So similarly. Thoughts about mindfulness or questions? Yeah, so then in meditation, really, you're just not forgetting what you're meditating on, <laughs> okay? So you're meditating on love, then you have a brilliant idea about compassion. You think, yes, compassion is a very good thing, but right now I'm meditating on love. Uh, yes, Venerable Tenzin Chogi La, Hey there. Um, so it's interesting, like you were saying, the, uh, you know, different definitions of mindfulness, and I'm thinking of John Kabat-Zinn's in mindfulness-based stress reduction, like non-judgmental present moment awareness, which seems really different from recollection. And I'm just wondering, how, yeah, what, how, how to how did those two things evolve? And is it just a Theravada, you know, Northern school, Southern school difference? Or what do you think about that? Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm not totally sure, except for we know that both traditions, you know, Pali tradition and Sanskrit tradition do foreclose placements of mindfulness. And that is recollecting an object that you know. And so they use it in that same sense as this description here, both traditions. So I'm wondering where he's pulled the word from and if it's something more akin to attention and kind of conditioning your attention or what you're holding in mind mm. to just kind of observe, you know? That's yeah, kind of what it feels like they're doing in that, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it does. And, you know, it's interesting because um, it's like attention is there regardless of how much intention you give to it, but maybe they're kind of mixing together a few different ideas um, but, I, you know, I keep coming back to the foreclosed placements of mindfulness because despite the fact that you're holding your mind on something that you have previously understood, you still are observing it in a non-reactive way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if they're just taking like one half of that training and not talking about what it is you're stabilizing on first and then observing non-reactively. Right. right. 
Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm curious about it too. Does anyone else know <laughs> where, where do these other folks get it from? What are they talking about? I'm looking around. Yeah, but yeah, we should keep investigating because, and then of course, you know, like pop psychology harvests that and then waters it down. And then, you know, it's just becomes kind of like whatever. And um, I, I mean, Rimshay Blesses Hardy was once kind of teasing and saying, sometimes you hear people who have mindfulness that goes, um, I am walking, I am walking, I am making pee pee, I am going to toilet, I am eating as if that is some sort of virtue in and of itself. And he says there's no point in that, you know, that uh, that's like a thief being careful as they tiptoe into a house that just being on top of what you're doing is of little benefit unless it's conditioned with something positive like bodhicitta. So yes, I don't know, I keep checking. Text me if you find a source, though, because I want to know, too. <laughs> uh, Snay, yes, please. I oh, I see some Australians have joined us. We had daylight savings time, Australians. I'm so sorry. Um, yes, Snay, go ahead. I think you just touched on what I was going to ask. I thought on the slide, the definition of mindfulness was that it is always associated with a virtuous mind. And that was because I've also heard, you know, this thing about mindfulness is a mental factor and it can be applied in, you know, by anyone. And hence, you know, the most mindful people are torturous because their job is to try to extract and, and see where they can inflict maximum pain and, you know, mindfulness in the military and so forth. So that's why I was surprised just to, to see that it's only with yeah. virtuous minds. And then you were saying about Lama Zupa Rinpoche just now about that practice. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm, um, I'm drawing from the compendium of knowledge view on this, which is that it's always accompanying a virtuous mind, partially because um, you can identify its virtue by its stability. When it's non virtuous, there is an agitation. So it's not to say that there aren't many other types of focus besides mindfulness, and that people might call any number of kinds of focus the name mindfulness, but that doesn't make it mindfulness from our school of thought. So, you know, we say there are 51 mental factors, but that's of course not an exhaustive list. We're talking about the like the 51 main mental factors that are most relevant to us in our life. You know, and we're not talking about the 84,000 different delusions or, you know, the whole like lists upon lists. We're just kind of talking about the main ones. So it's, it's an interesting point of confusion. And I think sometimes when, you know, Buddhist meditation techniques are harvested and then kind of given to the corporate world and it just makes people more focused little workers. And is that just kind of serving the needs of capitalism? And that seems dodgy. We would not be calling that mindfulness, we would be calling that appropriation, right? And, you know, and Buddhism is an open practice, right? Like, we're very happy to share our tools with all sorts of non Buddhists, you know, only Tantra is a closed practice, the rest of Buddhism totally open, take what you like, leave what you don't, unless you're a card carrying Buddhist, then you need to like, think about some of the core things and make sure you adhere to those. But otherwise, we're very open about stuff. But I think one of the main things to understand if you're sharing Buddhist techniques in non-Buddhist settings is, is it moving in a way that's altruistic? It doesn't have to be moving in a way that we would define as Buddhahood or Nirvana or anything very particularly Buddhist, but is it at least conditioned by altruism? Because otherwise it's really taking the point of Buddhism out of it. And that feels dodgy. Yeah, like that. Yeah, Jackie? Yeah. Um, hi, I, um, I think I've heard things said about mindfulness, similarly to what Venerable Tenzing Choki just mentioned, that is to know the moment, to know at the present, to know what's going on. And, um, and I did apply it to my daily life in a case that if I if I'm not mindful enough of where I put my stuff, then I forget. So if I be mindful that I close the door, then I, you know, then I remember that I close the door and I don't have to go back and check. So, um, yeah, so it's like paying attention, knowing, be aware, 
um, at, at the present moment. Yeah, and that is a general understanding for sure. Um, it, it's just that we're talking about something very specific here. So what you're talking about is remembering things that are important, proceed. It's a good practice and it will help develop your concentration. It will help develop all sorts of things. Remember things that are important with more intention and purposefulness. That's a good practice for all of us. And what we're saying here is best practice is to do that with an agenda of overall altruism to be of benefit to all sentient beings. That's, you know, best practice, best use of this mental factor. But if it's at the very least not harmful, you know, not self-centered, and if it kind of goes into the areas of self-centeredness and self-cherishing, then it's not what we would call mindfulness. It's just a type of focus. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we're, we've got a couple more and then we'll have a stretch and then a meditation. Okay, so then concentration. This in this case is talking about single pointedness. There are of course many types of concentration. Here we're talking about single pointedness. This dwells one pointedly for a sustained period of time on a single object, meaning a mental object. It's the basis for developing serenity, shine shamatha, and increasing wisdom. So this is the concentration that you know and love. This is the single pointedness that we're trying to cultivate in many other virtuous areas. It's the focus that will help give our projects power, but there are many types of concentration, not, this, not just this one, but this one is the basis for developing full-fledged full calm abiding. And then we have wisdom, um, sometimes translated as understanding or intelligence, which functions to discriminate precisely with analysis, the qualities, faults, or characteristics of an object held by mindfulness. So holding in mind non-forgetfulness of mind, holding in mind the object, then you're able to go more deeply and penetrate more accurately what it actually is and then where to go from there. And it cuts through indecision and doubt with certainty and maintains the root of all constructive qualities in this and future lives. So this is where you get that conversation about developing intelligence. There's various types. There's what we would call inborn intelligence that is the natural acuity of mind that comes as the result of karma from previous lives. So this is things that maybe people like Tukluz would have or people like uh, savants and child prodigies. It's not like they were just born magic. It's because of the conditioning of their previous lives was able to kick in in this life. It's the result of karma. But most relevant to us is acquired understanding or wisdom cultivated in this life. A person may generate it with respect to various topics of the stages of the path. And there are three types. And this is where you get the conversation on the wisdom arisen from hearing, the wisdom arisen from reflection, the wisdom arisen from meditation. So these three types of wisdom is the project of our work. So right now we're developing the wisdom arisen from hearing and a little bit of reflection and meditation. And cycling through these three again and again and again is how we develop the deep understanding that then cannot be shaken. Okay, so we'll summarize those guys next week, but right now we'll just have a two minute stretch and then a short meditation. So have a stretch and I'll see you in a sec.
Okay, everybody come on back. And uh, pop on your videos or send me an emoji so I know you're back. Okay, mostly back. All right, so, so last week we did a meditation where we were trying to really penetrate the essence of the five omnipresent mental factors experientially. And I think today let's go back to the gentle clarity of mind meditation and do that more simple spacious one. And then next week we'll do a more kind of penetrative analytical one, trying to kind of define and organize and find those different aspects of mind. So rather than load you up, let's go back to a nice simple one because this one is really useful um, for many reasons. So just come back to a good posture, something that feels stable and balanced. And just take a minute to check in with your body and let go of any physical tension that you might've gathered. And a few deep intentional breaths, letting yourself settle. and come back to your altruistic motivation. May all of my mental, verbal, and physical activity, in particular this meditation, lead to the, to the development of my fullest potential so that I can be of greatest benefit to both self and others. You can frame that in your own words to yourself, but let yourself reconnect with altruism. and shift your focus to the breath. simple and direct focus without anticipation.
attentive to the breath, mindful of the breath, concentrated on the breath, with a mind that is focused but also relaxed. And now gradually shift away from your breath to observation of your own mental activity. Whether thoughts that are in words or in pictures or sounds, or if it's spacious, just be aware of the activity of your mind without engaging with it. watching without interference. and see if you can watch your thoughts without agreeing with them or disagreeing with them, without push or pull, without following or suppressing, just watch.
When the mind is busy, you simply know it's busy. When it's quiet, you simply know that it's quiet. And now see if you can gradually become less interested in the activity and movement of all of your mental factors and more interested in the primary mental consciousness. Spacious and aware, reflective, but the aspect of mind that gives no commentary, that simply reflects. See if you can shift your focus, your interest there. The thoughts continue to come and go, but they're not your interest anymore. Be with the main mind. A mind that is focused without stress, spacious, but not spacey, relaxed, but not vague, broad open awareness.
And don't be too worried if you've found the main mind or not. Just stay in a non-reactive stance. Bright and open. And if a train of thought captures your attention, gently release it, come back to open focus. And shift back to awareness of your body. Feel grounded and stable. Aware of your posture once again. At home in your own skin. And we dedicate. Janchu Sanchorim Poshe, Make Panam Ke Yuchi, Ke Pan Yampa Me Pai, Gone Gondu Pawasho, Tony Dawarim Poshe, Make Panam Ke Yuchi, Ke Pan Yampa Me Pai. Gone gondu pelwashu. Okay. So thanks so much, folks. Um, lovely to see you. And if you have um, topics you really want to drill down into or questions, um, you're free to email um, the SPC at Land of Medicine Buddha and she'll forward those to me. And um, have a great night. <laughs>